You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC-88 Paradise, the series where we take a close look at classic games for the NEC PC-88, the most popular Japanese PC series of the 1980s. Long before they became Square Enix, the game developer Enix was best known for the Dragon Quest series on the Nintendo Famicom and other consoles. But during the 1980s and early 1990s, Enix actually released more games for Japanese PCs than they did for consoles, most of which remain almost completely unknown in the West. Today I'm going to play their final PC-88 game, Fangs, The Saga of Wolfblood, released in 1991. So let's get right into it. The game comes in a clamshell case with no screenshots on the back. That's always reassuring, isn't it? But we do get some awesome quotable quotes from the game characters, like, Come on, Wolf Fang Fighter. Because we believe you. Be true to me. And last but not least, Go to the hell, f -er. Hey you, come on, Red's white. Inside we have the game manual, which opens up sideways. This opening story on the first page I find almost impossible to read with this font and background. Luckily it's identical to the one in the game opening, which is far more legible. There isn't any info on the characters at all, but the section detailing the spells and items is indispensable since there isn't any information on them given in the game. The game is stored on six floppy disks, and to start we simply insert the first two of them. The game boots to the Enix logo, which remains on screen for over a minute. I have no idea what's being loaded here, but you have to wait for this every time you boot the game. I didn't even know the PC-88 had enough RAM to necessitate loading screens this long. Once it's finished, we finally get the opening sequence and the game's story. Fangs takes place in the land of Edelwolf, which consists of three islands and is known for being the only place in the world inhabited by both humans and the wolf people. One day, evil demons appeared and began ravaging the villages of the peaceful wolf people, driving them near extinction. Fortunately, a lone human warrior appeared and fought them off, but died shortly after due to his wounds. Inspired by his courage, the wolf people took up arms and joined the humans in order to seal away the Dark Lord using six sacred wolf fangs. Many years of peace followed. One day, a wolfman named Numitor found two human babies abandoned in the mountains. He raised them as his own and named them Romulus and Remus. Do you know the story of Romulus and Remus? Sons of Mars, god of war. The brothers were abandoned and raised by wolves. Now Romulus and Remus have come of age, but wouldn't you know it, the Dark Lord has returned and Edelwolf is filled with monsters again. Romulus has left home to fight the Dark Lord, but hasn't returned. The player takes control of Remus, whose goal is to find the six sacred wolf fangs which seal away the Dark Lord and destroy him once and for all. We get the game's credits at the end of the opening. The most famous person who worked on fangs is monster designer Yoshitaka Tamaki, who also did the monster designs for Sega's Shining Force games, among others. During the opening, you can press any key to skip to the load menu, but if you wait to the end of the opening, a new game will begin automatically. You'll be asked to replace Disc 2 with Disc 3. We begin at the house of Numitor, the old man who raised Romulus and Remus. Here we can open the save menu, where we also get the option at the bottom to create a user disc, which I'm going to do right away. The user disc is actually just a copy of Disc 1, and can be used in place of Disc 1 once you have one. You can actually just save to the original disc if you want, but I prefer to use the user disc instead. You may have already noticed the music in Fang sounds pretty good, though this village BGM here can sound a bit too dissonant for my ears at times. Let's exit to the overworld for some even better music. Being a very late release on the PC-88, Fangs supports the pc 88 soundboard too, and makes atypically heavy use of its ADPCM channel. You can hear some of the unusual samples they chose to use here. Fangs uses so many ADPCM samples, I would wager it's probably one of the main reasons the game uses six floppy disks. 
Keep in mind that PC-88 floppies only hold 720 kilobytes, so sound samples will quickly fill up one of these discs. I can't help but notice that it looks like Remus is frowning all the time. He looks pretty unhappy to be in this game. I know that probably isn't supposed to be his mouth, but once you see it. Another thing I like about Fangs is how much of the screen it fills, with no frame surrounding the gameplay. Of course it still has the same bumpy scrolling as in all PC-88 games. Your character also walks quite slowly, especially when the screen is scrolling. Unlike some of the other PC-88 games I've covered, Fangs doesn't have adjustable speed settings, so this is all you get. Of course you won't be able to walk around for very long without getting into a battle, where you'll hear some more rocking music. Now the battle screen here looks a lot like early Dragon Quest games, because basically it is. Everything here is extremely basic and works exactly like you would expect from a typical old school JRPG. Attack, run, defend, magic, and items are your only choices. Fangs even has enemy groups, as in many of the Dragon Quest games, where you can choose to attack a group of the same enemy, but you can't choose to target a specific enemy in that group. If one of your characters is killed in battle, you'll need to bring them to a church in one of the towns to revive them, until you finally learn a revival spell very near the end of the game. In town you also have inns and item and equipment shops, which all work much the way you would expect. It is nice that the equipment shops show what can be used by each character, and you can usually infer how strong each piece of equipment is from the prices. Fangs is controlled using the number pad to move your character around, return or space to confirm, and escape or zero to cancel. The caps lock is used to increase the message speed, and you're going to want to make sure this is always set to on in order to make the battles go faster. Additionally, 5 on the number pad is used to change pages in your inventory during battle. This is unintuitive and it's the only way to get to all of your items, so good luck figuring that out if you don't have the manual. One cool keyboard function though is that while using torches in the caves, you can hold the shift key to move the light around and see more of your surroundings without having to move and risk getting attacked. So I haven't mentioned the gamepad at all, and that's because Fangs has no gamepad support whatsoever. This is a bit surprising for such a late PC-88 release, and in fact, all of the RPGs I've covered on PC-88 Paradise up until now support the joystick port. There is no reason they couldn't have done the same in Fangs. Of course, this isn't an action game, so playing with the keyboard works fine, but as a born and raised console gamer, I would really love to be able to play this game on real hardware with a controller. What if I want to get out my controller extensions and play some Fangs while laying back on the couch? For PC-98, I have the Elecom JC-82, which is a keyboard emulator. You plug a controller into it and then plug it into the keyboard port, allowing you to play keyboard-only games with a controller. This is a legacy device from when the PC-98 was popular, and it's getting really hard to find nowadays. I'm glad I have one. But of course this device is for PC-98 and won't fit into the keyboard port on the PC-88. On the PC-88 there was a similar keyboard emulator called the Pasota, but even if I had one of these, I wouldn't be able to use it on my PC-88 since it uses the larger DIN plug used only on earlier PC-88 models. If only I could use this PC-98 keyboard emulator on the PC-88. A PC-98 to PC-88 keyboard adapter would do the trick, but I've never seen such an adapter. I did manage to find a guy who makes PC-98 to USB keyboard adapters, intended for people who want to use an old clicky PC-98 keyboard on their modern Windows PC. The adapter requires a USB-C cable. So now, combined with my PC-98 keyboard emulator, I have the inputs on my MSX gamepad being converted to modern USB key presses. So I can just plug this into my USB to PC-88 keyboard adapter from ClassicPC.org, which I already use anyway, and this should do the trick. Finally, in order to still be able to use the keyboard on Fangs, I'll plug my modern USB keyboard into my USB to PC-98 keyboard adapter, and plug that into the keyboard input on the keyboard emulator. Here's what the entire contraption looks like all put together. Now we're ready to play some fangs. And yes, of course, there probably were other ways I could have done this more easily. I've heard of a gamepad to PS2 keyboard emulator, which some people use for playing games on old MS-DOS machines. If I had one of those, I could then get a PS2 to PC-88 keyboard adapter and use that. But this is what I was able to rig together using mostly what I already had on hand. 
It would be awesome if someone could make a modern gamepad to keyboard adapter for newer PC-88 models, but I don't know how much demand there would be for a device like that. So now with my contraption attached, I can confirm it actually does work. I can move my character around, but both of the trigger buttons are confirmed, and I can't move diagonally. By default, the keyboard emulator assigns the two trigger buttons to the space and enter keys, which are both confirm in fangs. And for the diagonals, it uses these keys on the number pad. Some games, especially shooters, use these for diagonal, but fangs doesn't. It simply uses the two directions pressed together. By switching to red mode, we can change the triggers to Z and X instead of space and enter, but Fangs doesn't use these either. We're going to have to switch to the yellow flashing edit mode. This gives us an on-screen menu where we can first change to pattern 4, which will give us just the four direction keys on the number pad instead of 8. We then can assign any key for each button, including the directions. This thing is actually quite versatile. I'll assign the left trigger to escape or zero, which will allow me to cancel in fangs, and just keep the right trigger assigned to enter for confirm. So now I have only one problem left. The on-screen menu I've been using is for the PC-98 DOS prompt. If I unplug the keyboard emulator from the PC-98 to switch to PC-88, it loses power and goes back to the default settings. I tried to use the basic prompt on PC-88 for the setup instead, but it doesn't seem to work. I'm guessing that the key presses the keyboard emulator sends in order to create the menus are too fast for the PC-88 to keep up with. So there's only one way to do this. We gotta do this blind. I'll just boot up Fangs with my controller contraption attached, activate edit mode, and imagine the on-screen menu in my head while I assign the buttons. With a little practice, this actually isn't as hard as it sounds. I'm able to do this quickly now every time I power up the game, and this Enix logo at the beginning gives you plenty of time to set up the controller while you're waiting. Now I can move diagonally, and I have trigger buttons for confirm and cancel. Both buttons also bring up the menu. Once this is set up, it's amazing how well it works. There's probably some considerable input lag, but with an RPG, I don't notice it at all. Hell, let's get out the Genesis controller and controller adapter instead of this tiny MSX pad. I played through most of Fangs using this setup. I even played on the couch for much of the game. I should have used this for the Mario Brothers special video. And I can finally play the Dojin shooter Revolter. I always thought that game ought to have gamepad support. I can't believe people used to play this on a keyboard. So anyway, let's finally get back to Fangs. You begin with only Remus, and have a few towns and caves to get through before you can expand your party. Some villagers have been taken captive by a monster who intends to sacrifice them. This is the first boss of the game. The boss BGM makes good use of ADPCM for an intro that hardly even sounds like PC-88. The bosses in this game really don't mess around. Whenever I got to one, I almost always had to do some grinding before I could beat them. Upon defeating the first boss, two of the villagers Remus saves decide to join his party. A healer named Media and an attacker named Gallum. We aren't given any of their backstory, since in general, this game doesn't have any. On PC-88 Paradise, we've covered games like Burai and Legend of Heroes, where the characters have quite a bit of dialogue. But Fangs is much more old school, where characters only have brief and dry expository lines of dialogue in order to guide you through the game. In other words, the characters don't have much character, and there aren't even any on-screen illustrations in the game aside from the opening, if that even counts. So in the next area of the game, we need to obtain the first of the wolf fangs, which seal away the Dark Lord. We talk to a dead guy at the cemetery, who tells us about the cave we need to go through to find it. But when we get there, unfortunately the fang has already been stolen by bandits, who turn out to be monsters. There's a difficult battle here, but I guess it isn't considered to be a boss, and it doesn't play the boss BGM. After that, we get the first fang. To find the second fang, we get an item which allows us to pass through a volcano, which on the other side is a tower, where we fight a winged fire skull dog with a scorpion tail. The area of the game with the third fang has new overworld music. It's really nice that this game changes up the BGM a few times throughout the game in order to keep things fresh. Only the main battle music does get a little old by the end, though of course it still does rock. 
The people of the town in this area mistake Remus's party for mountain bandits due to a wanted poster in the town with the party's faces on it. When you defeat the real bandits in their cave hideout, the game automatically sends you back to the town before allowing you to see what's in these chests. Luckily, the warp spell in the game allows you to warp immediately to many important locations once you find them, including the bandit hideout. This, combined with the dungeon exit spell you learn later, makes getting around this game generally pretty easy. In the chest there's mostly junk, but also an item called a light, which completely lights up the caves for the rest of the game, eliminating the need for torches. They probably were expecting a lot of players to miss this and have to continue buying torches for the rest of the game. It's like a present for those players who bothered to go back and see what's in these chests. In the same area of the game, there's another cave which is a maze of holes to fall through in order to get where you need to go in the lower floors. I love how the BGM here has an 80 PCM sample of a scream in it. At the end of the cave, there's a monster who's stolen the third fang. He promises to give it to you if you beat him. He keeps his promise and then asks Remus why he won't finish him off. In a rare instance where Remus actually speaks, he replies that he can see that the monster is honorable since he kept his promise, and that he should use that honor for good instead of evil. But while he's talking, a monster appears from behind and tries to stab Remus. One of the other party members, Gallum, protects Remus and is critically injured. He's forced to leave the party for the rest of the game. On the way to the next area, the honorable monster from earlier is waiting for Remus. Funny that he looks a little smaller than he did before. He offers to join the party. His name looks almost like it says Berserker, but it actually says Beru Sega. So anyway, Bell Sega says that the penalty for betraying the monsters is death, so the only way for him to win his freedom now is to defeat the Dark Lord. Wow, he has actual motivations. That's more than I can say for most of the other characters in this game. In the next area, a student of magic asks you to save his master, who's been taken to a tower nearby. Save him, and he joins your party. The master does, that is, not the student. His name is Musa, and is a user of attack magic. His regular attack is generally so useless, you're probably going to want to have him use attack magic in most of the battles, at least until he runs low on MP. Some of these attack spells look like they're going to break my screen. The attack magic is generally pretty nerfed in this game, though. Only certain spells work on certain enemies at all, and even when they do, they'll often just randomly miss and say ineffective, whereas your physical attacks never miss, so this game is really all about the physical attacks. For the bosses, Musa is most useful for his spell which increases the strength of the two attacker characters. After some dungeons where you'll need to use three staves to create a waterfall, freeze a lake, and part some water, you'll meet the guardian of the fourth fang, who just gives it to you. There's no boss. When Musa's student comes to say farewell to his master before he leaves for the next area, there's two of him. I'm seeing double here. Four crusties. Which is the imposter? Would my real student please use the shape-changing spell I taught him to turn into something? Sure thing. <laughs> I never taught my student a shape-changing spell. That's actually pretty clever when you think about it. The next area has you visiting a kingdom in the sky, where you fight a sort of phoenix character. This is probably the toughest boss in the game. She randomly switches modes from being on the ground or in the air, and while in the air she's super strong and can only be hit with magic. You really have to just keep fighting her over and over again until you get lucky and she randomly decides to spend most of her time on the ground. She gives you the fifth fang. The next area has a deserted town where everyone lives in a secret passage underground and an impassable marsh. The only way through it is to hitch a ride on totally not a chocobo. There's also a shrine you have to enter, where a weird harp music is always being played that damages your party. Use the Sphere of Silence obtained in the tower nearby to shut that music up. Later this dungeon has passages where gusts of wind periodically blow you back. This first one has walls along it which can be used to avoid the wind and gradually proceed forward, but this one doesn't. You need to obtain the stone shoes elsewhere in the dungeon in order to get through. Then the boss is the asshole who was playing the harp earlier. A common pattern this game likes to use for the bosses is requiring you to use a special item on them at certain times in order to prevent them from unleashing a deadly attack. For instance, with this boss, you have to watch for the text that says that he is playing the harp, then use the sphere of silence on him to avoid having your party put to sleep. 
It would be nice if these bosses where you have to use items over and over again had graphical tells, but unfortunately most of them only have text. Anyway, defeat him to get the last fang. Then we're taken to this area where we have to place the six fangs on these warp blobs, and also place them on these chests in order to obtain Remus's best equipment in the game. I guess this is the way the seal of the Dark Lord is broken. Then we're taken to the final dungeon, which is actually not that long. Here we finally meet Remus's missing brother Romulus. There's not really much to spoil, but I'll put a warning here anyway just in case anyone minds. Romulus has been turned into a monster, and he says that instead of defeating the Dark Lord, Remus should join him so that together they can rule the world as brother and brother. Of course, Remus refuses and they fight. In a quarrel, Romulus killed Remus. It's a great story. Luckily, that doesn't happen in Fangs. After Remus beats him, Romulus is turned back to normal and doesn't remember anything. He wants to join Remus to defeat the Dark Lord, but Remus notices he is critically injured and refuses to take him along. Romulus agrees to stay behind, and soon after, we meet the Dark Lord, Etrius. He has two phases. In the first one, you have to watch for the text that says he has opened a portal to darkness, and then use a magic item you obtained earlier on him. If you fail to do this, he'll suck one of your characters in and there's no way to bring them back. After a certain amount of damage, he'll reveal his quote unquote true form, which is really just a yellow version of the same boss. This phase is actually a little easier since he no longer sucks characters into portals, throwing balls of energy at you instead. They're pretty brutal, but at least they can't permanently take a character away. Overall, the end boss is about as hard as the other bosses in the game. Just like the others, I had to do a bit of grinding once I got to him, but he went down eventually. There is zero dialogue after you finish the end boss. It dumps you back to the end of the dungeon where you were, and you just have to walk back to where you left Romulus. Then it just shows them both walking out of the dungeon together without a word. And finally, you just get the credit roll over a black screen. Hmm, I was kind of hoping for more of an epilogue and maybe some character art. But at least the credits music is awesome. So that's Fangs, the saga of wolf blood. I think my comments on the ending sum up the main issue with the game overall. They clearly worked really hard on the music. It's definitely the best part of the game. The quality and sheer number of tracks is quite impressive. The game is also quite long, though I probably made it look short in this video. But when it comes to plot and characters, the game is really bare bones. The only illustrations of the characters that exist at all are the ones on the front and back of the packaging. Some more artwork within the game would have really helped to flesh out the characters and world of the game in my opinion. I have no idea whether they originally had plans to add that sort of thing, but the game does feel almost unfinished as a result, especially the ending. And again, the character dialogue is minimal. I mean, when you walk up to a boss just standing there at the end of a dungeon, he says basically, Bwahaha, you can't defeat me, and it just goes into the boss fight, the game feels decidedly quite old school, even for 1991. For reference, that's the same year that Final Fantasy IV was released. But on the other hand, when Fangs was released, Dragon Quest IV was the newest Dragon Quest game, and V was still a long ways off. So I guess when you take it in the context of just Enix RPGs, it kind of makes sense. Though the Dragon Quest games actually feel like they have more of a unique character to them than Fangs does, in my opinion. This Japanese player who did a write-up on Fangs I found online also opined that the game feels like it's missing that little extra something to make it stand out from other RPGs. Despite all that, I would still say that I quite enjoyed my playthrough of Fangs. The dungeons are fun, the battle system is perfectly functional, and rarely did I find it overly difficult to progress the game. If you can read Japanese and pay attention to what the few characters in the towns are saying, it's generally pretty obvious what you need to do next. I couldn't even find a Japanese walkthrough for the game, though there is a complete playthrough video if you need help. Normally, this is the part of the video where I would show you all the ports of Fangs for other systems, but this time, there aren't any. Fangs was made exclusively for the PC-88. To be honest, I probably wouldn't have given Fangs the time of day if I had played it back in the 90s. Many of the more mediocre RPGs I picked up on the Super Famicom and PC Engine would fail to keep my attention for more than a few hours. I usually only made it all the way through the ones that seemed really interesting. Weirdly, I find I have a much higher tolerance for these old school RPGs nowadays, 30 years later. After having just played a brand new JRPG for over 100 hours, I find the experience of going back to something much simpler to be quite cathartic. 
That's just my experience anyway. I'm not expecting that most of you watching this video will be playing through Fangs for yourself anytime soon, but at least now you know what the game is all about. A decent little RPG from Enix in 1991 that's just a little old fashioned, but does have great music. And also I played it with a gamepad. Thanks for watching this episode of PC88 Paradise. Likes and shares are appreciated as always, and I did set up a Patreon recently for those interested. Please be sure to notice though that this Patreon is only for videos by me, Mr. Jakes, not those by my brother, Neo Alec, like his Neo Geo Generation series. Bye for now, and I'll see you in the next video. This is Mr. Jakes for PC88 Paradise, signing off.